Welcome to the exciting universe of music theory. Are you ready to learn? Then let's begin. Today we will talk about the Pythagorean comma. What is the Pythagorean comma? This is not a simple concept and it will involve explaining some other things first. It will also involve some math. To start, it helps if you understand the harmonic series. We won't go deep into harmonics in this video. It is helpful if you explore this and understand it well. But let's do a quick review now. When objects vibrate to produce sound, they don't merely move back and forth. They wiggle and jiggle in complex movements. And each way that something moves will have a frequency. Those frequencies are called partials. Those partials determine how we perceive the timbre of a sound. The partials of a sound can be chaotic and unordered. Or they may be orderly and geometric. If you constrain the movement of something, like a string pulled tightly, then we limit the ways in which it can vibrate. Often this produces partials that have a geometric relationship to each other, in simple ratios. These partials with simple ratio proportions are called harmonics, and the whole series of them are called the harmonic series. When we perceive a sound as having a pitch, it is because its vibration has an identifiable fundamental frequency of vibrations per second. For example, let's consider the A string of a cello. The fundamental frequency, the one that we perceive as its pitch, is 220 Hz. We call this the first harmonic in the harmonic series for the note called A. The second harmonic is the one produced by dividing a vibrating thing in half. This produces a sound one octave above the fundamental. To calculate its frequency, we multiply 220 by 2, which equals 440. The sound produced by the first and second harmonics, an octave apart, sounds very pure and pleasing to our ears, because the two tones have matching periodicity where one tone vibrates twice as fast as the other. The third harmonic is produced by dividing a vibrating thing into three equal parts. The resulting frequency is the fundamental, 220, times 3 which equals 660. This produces a sound one octave plus a fifth above the fundamental. It sounds like this. That ideal sound of a perfect fifth, produced by the second and third harmonics, sounds very pure and pleasing to our ears. Here they are sounding at the same time. When a fifth interval is tuned in this way, we call it a just fifth. That ideal tuning of a just fifth can be expressed as a ratio of the second harmonic to the third harmonic, or simply 2 to 3. This means to find a frequency 1 just fifth above a fundamental tone, we multiply the frequency by 3 halves, or 1.5. There are other pleasing intervals in the harmonic series. For instance, the tuning of a major third is found between the fourth and fifth harmonics. When two voices sing in this precise tuning, we experience it as a beautiful harmonious combination, because their harmonics align. So we have established that the pure and pleasing tuning of a just fifth interval comes from the harmonic series in the ratio of 3 to 2. And we know that to raise a frequency by a just fifth, we multiply the frequency by 1.5. Similarly, a pure and pleasing tuning of a just major third is the ratio of 5 to 4. And to raise a tone by a third, we multiply its frequency by 5 quarters. Let's use this knowledge to tune a harpsichord. Start with the pitch D, which we will set at the frequency of 288 Hz using a tuning fork. Using our ears as the finely calibrated instruments they are, we will use the harmonic series to tune up and down fifths from that reference pitch. We will travel up clockwise around the circle of fifths to G sharp, and counterclockwise to E flat, tuning every note in the 12 tone chromatic scale as we go. Bear with me because this will take some time. If you want to skip ahead, do so now. Up a fifth from D is A. Since D is 288 Hz, a has a frequency of 288 Hz times 1.5, which is 432 Hz. Up a fifth from A is E. It has a frequency of 432 Hz times 1.5, which is 648 Hz. Now let's tune the E, one octave below, which is achieved by dividing by 2. That E is 324 Hz. 
Tuning the 8 of the B is 324 hertz times 1.5, which is 486 hertz. Up from the B to F sharp is 729 hertz. Again we will tune down an octave from there, setting our F sharp at 364.5 hertz. Up a fifth from F sharp is C sharp, at 546.75 hertz. Brought down another octave we arrive at 273.375 hertz. Finally up one fifth from C sharp is G sharp, with a frequency of 410.0625 hertz. Now we will start back at D, and tune our fifths downward. A fifth below D, is G, which is 288 hertz divided by 1.5, which is 192 hertz. Bringing that up an octave, the G is 384 hertz. Down a fifth from G, is C, with a frequency of 256 hertz. Down a fifth from that is F, which equals 170 and two thirds, or 170.666 repeating. Bringing that up an octave fills in the frequency for F at 341 and one third hertz. Down a fifth from F, is B flat, at 227.555 repeating, and up an octave is 455.111 hertz. And our final note is down a fifth from B flat giving a C flat with a frequency of 303.407 repeating. Great, we now have a chromatic scale, from which we can extrapolate out all the other octaves. That sounds great. This tuning is called Pythagorean tuning. It is named after Pythagoras, the Greek mathematician who also showed us how to calculate the length of a hypotenuse. And we know that our fifths all sound great because we tuned them precisely to each other using just fifths. What happened there? It's definitely not in tune like the others. Why does this one not sound right? Music theorists call this interval the wolf fifth. It's also called the Procrustean fifth. To explain why it sounds out of tune, we will do what Pythagoras did, and use some math. According to our circle of fifths, we should be able to travel by a perfect fifth interval 12 times, and we will arrive at the same pitch class where we began. Observe, on the left is a stack of 12 fifths starting on a very low C, and ending on a very high B sharp, which, because of the circle of fifths, we assume to be in harmonic or equivalent to C. On the right is a stack of 7 octaves spanning the same distance. This illustrates that we assume that 12 fifths should be the same as 7 octaves. To transpose the bottom pitch to the top one using justly tuned fifths, we multiply it by 1.5, 12 times. Another way to express that is 1.5 to the power of 12. To transpose the bottom pitch to the top one using octaves, we multiply by 2, 7 times. This can be expressed as 2 to the power of 7. Our tuning problem arises because, although these two values are quite close, they are not equal. 2 to the power of 7 is 128. 1 and a half to the power of 12 is equal to 129.7463. So there it is. Our tidy circle of fifths is a lie. The numbers do not add up perfectly, and our perfectly tuned fifths do not produce a neat closed circle of octave equivalents. They are quite close, but not equal. That difference is called the Pythagorean comma. It is a small but noticeable difference between an interval of 12 just fifths and 7 octaves. The Pythagorean comma is equal to approximately a quarter of a semitone. The word comma means, an act of cutting. It signifies the small portion that must be trimmed away in order for fifths and octaves to fit neatly together. The Pythagorean comma is like a leap day, as you know. A year is not exactly 365 days. The speed that our planet rotates does not fit neatly into the duration of our planet's orbit around the sun. So we occasionally inject an extra day into the calendar to account for the small difference. In this metaphor, the leap day is like our Pythagorean comma. It is a little extra bit that must be accounted for in order for two things to fit together. Videos like this one exist because of the generous donations of patrons like you. If you watched that all the way through, I bet you enjoy geeking out on all this nerdy stuff. So please consider becoming a patron of the exciting universe of music theory. For as little as $1 per month, 
you can help ensure the creation of great resources, including videos like this one. Go to patreon.com slash music theory, become a patron, and you'll not only be acknowledged on these materials, but you'll also be the first to know when new materials are completed. And finally, give this video a like, share it, and subscribe to this channel.